Chapter 11 is all about interest groups. At the top of your notes sheet, you can see the learning targets for this chapter. First, we'll explain what an interest group is, and then we'll identify the main factors that led to their rise in America. Then we'll detail the various types of interest groups and explain the types of people who tend to join those groups. Next, we'll summarize the ways interest groups relate to social movements, and then we'll explain the various ways interest groups try and influence the policymaking process. Finally, we'll describe the ways in which interest groups' political activity is limited. Now, you should have read through the chapter and taken a look at these four questions on your notes sheet. So the first one asks, do interest groups dominate government, and is there any particular lobby who's politically unbeatable? Meaning, they're kind of in control, even if they're not part of the government. What I kind of think of as a really powerful lobby would be the NRA, or the National Rifle Association. But by no means do they win all of their battles in Congress, even though they have a really powerful presence in American society. Um, so no, not really. Interest groups don't dominate the government. We have so many different government institutions and groups in America that no single group really can dominate. And government actions are simply an outcome of the many, many compromises and alliances between groups. So why do people join interest groups? It's, it's really for the same reasons that people join any organization. They want to get some of the incentives of joining, essentially. Um, and there's a variety of incentives for joining interest groups. The first and probably one of the more common is solidarity incentives. And those are incentives that provide social rewards, like that sense of community or sense of companionship. And then there's material rewards like money, tax breaks, that's going to be very important to businesses. And then there's purposive awards, and that's a benefit you receive from serving a cause, from reaching a group's goals, and so on. So the next question says, is the pro proliferation of a political action committee and other groups good or bad for our representative democracy? And your answer to this can totally vary. Um, one question I would ask of you is, are PACs, our interest groups, the factions that Madison addressed in Federalist Number 10? And what did he have to say about them? And then finally, should interest groups' political activities be restricted by law? Of course, this is an opinion question, but history shows that interest group activities are subject to many different regulations, such as we need to register lobbyists, we need to disclose our expenditures and our donors, and courts in the past have upheld these regulations, especially in terms of campaign finance regulations. But the courts also allow for loopholes for groups um, to get involved in politics. And courts have also overturned parts of regulations, citing the First Amendment. Now, what is an interest group? By definition, an interest group in a, is an organization of people with similar policy goals who enter the political process to try and achieve those goals, but they don't ever run their own candidates for political office. So essentially, they have the same goals and aims as a political party. They want to have an influence on policy and sort of the political process, but they never actually run candidates for office. Some examples of interest groups include the National Rifle Association, or the NRA, which are among the, the biggest spenders in terms of interest groups. And that's basically a coalition of gun owners. And then we have the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, a longtime big spending interest group that represents business and businesses across the United States. 
And then AARP is an interest group that focuses on social welfare for retired people. And so we have a variety of interest groups, many serving different purposes, and they tend to be centered around issues. Here you can see the annual lobbying expenditures for the Chamber of Commerce of the United States, which is one of the interest groups I talked about on the last slide. And you can see they've consistently spent tons of money year after year to promote their causes. They were the top spending interest group in 2014, and they spent $124 million. So what causes the rise of interest groups? There are a number of things that can lead to the development of interest groups. First would be broad economic developments. For example, farmers didn't really get involved in politics when they were just growing food for themselves and their families, but as soon as farmers got involved in the markets, they were impacted by government policy. And so economic developments like that, where farmers go from just sustaining themselves to selling in sometimes unstable markets, lead to a rise of an interest group to advocate for their cause. Government policy and government actions themselves can actually cause interest groups to come about as well. For example, if the government gets involved in a war, we now have a population of veterans, and as a result, we have a demand for pension for those veterans and other benefits to try and repay them for all they did for us during that war. So government policy itself and government actions can lead to the rise of interest groups. But interest groups don't just appear automatically when they're called for. Interest groups require organized leadership. They require leaders that are organized around a common cause. And then finally, government intervention can lead to the rise of interest groups. This kind of goes along with the government policy piece. But essentially, the more the government gets involved, in issues, the more interest groups will arise and expand to try and influence that policy that impacts them. So we're going to read an article about pizza and the pizza lobby, which we refer to as Big Pizza. Now this reading is up on Schoology as well as a worksheet that goes with it. But this reading is kind of an example of how a lobby grew from government intervention. As the government got more involved in food regulations, it led to the rise of what we refer to as big pizza. The next section of your notes is on the kinds of organizations. So there's a couple different kinds. First is the institutional interests. And that's when individuals or organizations represent other organizations. So, for example, the Chamber of Commerce serves an institutional interest. They represent all business interests. They're basically a coalition uniting around pro-business causes. Another example would be the American Council on Education, which represents almost all higher education institutions in America, including most of our colleges. And then there's a membership organization. And a membership organization is made up of average Americans who create an interest group that's organized around an idea that they're passionate about. For example, the NRA, the National Rifle Association, is a coalition, an organization of gun owners. And the NAACP is the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. And again, they're united around an idea that they're passionate about. 
Now, the issue with membership organizations is that oftentimes they face what we refer to as the free rider problem, and that's the tendency of individuals to avoid contributing to the public good, though they will still benefit from the other's actions. So they may agree with the cause, but not want to get involved and still benefit. They may agree with their Second Amendment rights, but they're not going to join the NRA. And whatever the NRA achieves is going to benefit them as gun owners as well. Same story with the NAACP. I said at the beginning of this lecture that most people join organizations or interest groups for the same reasons that they join any other organization. There are incentives to join. And one of those big incentives we refer to as solidarity incentives. And solidarity incentives are social rewards. It's that sense of communion, the sense of companionship and community that really gets people to join. It's kind of that feel-good stuff. And then there's material incentives. This is going to be especially important for businesses and a variety of corporate organizations, but they're going to want money or things of value, like tax breaks. And then there's purposive incentives. And those are incentives or rewards um, where the benefit comes from serving a cause. Again, kind of a feel-good benefit. You feel better that you have reached group goals and so on. And these organizations are going to attract members in different ways. There's a couple different types of organizations I want to talk about here. First is the ideological interest groups. And those are groups that appeal to interests or sets of beliefs. For example, Pro-Choice America is centered around a very controversial but passion-inducing idea. And people who want to rally around that idea would tend to join that interest group. Then we also have public interest lobbies, and those are organizations that benefit non-members or the public as a whole. However, this is a perceived benefit. This is an opinion. Pro-Choice America could think that what they are doing would benefit the public as a whole. They believe in their cause. But by the same coin, some of the public might not agree with what they're advocating for. So public interest lobbies are sometimes perceived when really they could be ideological interest groups. Public interest lobbies oftentimes are not controversial. They might be focused around non-controversial issues like getting more people to vote or raising money for foster children or adoption, and so on. Now, what happens when interest groups become too powerful? When they actually do start to tell your senator or representative what to do or say? Oftentimes, the actions of interest groups are left up to staffers or lobbyists. And so these actions may actually reflect what the staff or the lobbyists want to see more than what the members of that group actually believe. Now, a lobbyist is an activist who seeks to persuade members of the government to enact on legislation that would benefit their group. And their group might guide them. They might tell them what they need to be advocating for, but sometimes it's left up to the staffers and the lobbyists themselves. So we're going to watch a quick video here on lobbyists and Lobby Wow is the name of the video. And they're going to kind of expose what could potentially happen when interest groups become too powerful. Your notes packet asks, is it always to the benefit of the American people? And you can kind of fill that in um, based on this satirical clip. I have a comic for you here as well. 
says, no, I'm not a NASCAR driver. I'm a U.S. senator, suggesting that this U.S. senator has been kind of bought out by lobbyists and corporations and interest groups. And that can certainly happen. So this kind of boils down to what we refer to as the hyper-pluralist view of interest groups. And so when interest groups are too powerful and they get too much of what they want, we usually get bad policy for the American public. And often this policy has conflicting regulations, things that kind of work against each other. Also, some groups become part of what we call iron triangles, and they totally dominate a policy area. We're going to look at a clip from Iron Man to kind of try and describe iron triangles, but iron triangles are essentially the policy-making relationship between congressional committees, the bureaucracy who make regulations, and interest groups. So you can see Stark Industries here is our corporation, and then we have the Pentagon, which is part of our bureaucracy, and then the U.S. Congress, or Congressional Committee member. And how this kind of works is Stark Industries, the corporation, is going to give campaign contributions to a U.S. Senator or Representative. And then they're going to give some money at the request of Stark Industries to a bigger military budget. And then, now that the Pentagon has a bigger military budget, they sign their weapons contract to Stark Industries, which costs a lot of money. This works the other way as well. Stark Industries could give their weapons technology to the Pentagon, and then the Pentagon is going to kind of get this tough-on-terror credibility, and then Stark Industries is going to get access to key Congress people. So this can work in either direction, but essentially it's this relationship between these three cornerstones, the interest groups, the congressional committee members, and the bureaucracy. And sometimes as a result of this iron triangle, we get groups that are too powerful, that have too much control in the bureaucracy, in the Congress and congressional committees, and as a result, they get too much of what they want, and you get bad policy. So we're going to watch a clip from Iron Man. What I want you to do is try and locate in this little clip the three parts of this relationship. The bureaucracy, the congressional committee members, and then the corporation or the head of the corporation. Now the next section here is on the actions of interest groups. And my first question is, do the actions of interest groups reflect an upper class bias? Because wealthy people are more likely to join groups and to be active in them. And they're more organized and they get more done. Groups representing business or professions are way more numerous. There's many more of them and they're more well financed. They have more money and money can be power. So some questions to consider. Do interest groups and lobbyists always get what they want? Are business-oriented groups divided among themselves? Do we have divisions between what business owners think, things that divide them? And then are there profound cleavages or divisions in opinion between the upper class? that kind of eliminates this upper class bias. Now, interest groups often arise out of social movements. A widely shared demand for change in some aspect of the social or political order often results in the rise of interest groups. For example, the civil rights movement, the recent environmental and feminist movements, 
have all united people around a demand for change in how we treat the environment or how we treat women in different positions and things of that matter. The most important activity of interest groups, though, is lobbying. And lobbying is done by lobbyists. And in lobbying, they advocate for or seek political change. And lobbyists do a few things. First, they provide specialized but technical information to senators and representatives because oftentimes our senators and representatives are very busy and they don't have all the time to do all of the research about every bill that comes through their committee or the full House or the full Senate. And so they, in a way, rely on lobbyists to give them the information that they need. And usually lobbyists are going to give what we call political cues. And those are signals that tell a legislator what values are at stake in a vote and how that issue fits into his or her own political views or party agenda. And these political cues can certainly be biased, but... They are meant to sort of guide legislators in making this decision. This kind of works both ways. Information goes two ways. So it is not just the lobbyist to the congressperson, but oftentimes it is the lobbyist to their client, telling their client what they know about Congress, because information equals influence. And this often results in an earmark. And an earmark is a provision in a law that provides a benefit to a client without having to have been reviewed by merit-based appropriations. Essentially, it's earmarked in a department budget for a client. It doesn't have to go through all the shenanigans of committees, House, Senate, and so on. So funds are set aside in a department's budget for that client's project. And this is a type of pork barrel legislation or client politics. In pork barrel legislation, we're making legislation that is specific to our constituents. Now prior to 2011 reforms, congressmen didn't even need to identify themselves or the project the money was being set aside for. They could just do it. They could set aside the money without their name or their client's name attached. And that 2011 law meant to wean out some of the corruption that can happen between interest groups and congressmen or congresswomen in regards to earmarks and pork barrel legislation and so on. Now, over time we've shifted a little bit in how we do politics. Interest groups used to be very involved and used to be a very important part of the political process, and by all means, they certainly still are. But in recent years, it has become easier for the general public to access information and to access their public officials. And as a result, we've seen a transition from insider to outsider strategy. An outsider strategy focuses more on actions from the general public versus actions of interest groups to modify or change policy. So today, since the public has more access to information, email, phones, we have grassroots lobbying, and that's using the general public rather than lobbyists to contact their government officials about public policy. If you want to change something, you give them a call. You don't join an interest group to speak on your behalf. Now, the se next section talks about some activities of interest groups. And on your screen here, you can see this next section is about money. And so the National Rifle Association, this is how they spent their money in the 2012 campaign cycle. In 2012, it was $35 a year to be a member of the NRA. 
And some of that money is going to be used to hire lawyers, PR firms, advertising firms to organize conventions and gun shows and so on. But a lot of it is going to be spent by the NRA Political Victory Fund, which is the NRA's PAC, lobbyists, and on independent expenditures. So in 2012, the NRA's Political Victory Fund gave over $16 million to candidates. However, PACs are limited. They're subject to regulations. And so the NRA cannot contribute any more than $5,000 to an individual candidate. So how else can they influence politics? Well, in 2012, they spent $2.5 million on lobbyists, on hiring those people that actually work at the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. and try and have an impact on policy. And then they spent $11 million on electioneering communications independently of the campaign. So they spent money through super PACs and things of that nature to create their own independent campaign ads. And all of this money is spent in an attempt to influence our institutions of government, to influence public policy. So some of this money was spent on the courts, much of it was spent on Congress, the president, and the bureaucracy, literally all of our institutions of government. And money is important, but money is actually one of the less effective ways interest groups advance their causes. This wasn't always true. Actually, prior to campaign finance regulations, groups could literally spend unlimited amounts of money to bribe candidates to vote in their favor. Today, though, PACs are legal, and as a result, they are numerous, meaning there's tons of money available on both sides of about every issue. For all the money the NRA spends, there's plenty of other people spending tons of money advocating for more gun regulations and things of that nature. There's really only noticeable difference in money and expenditures when it comes to client politics. So money may make a difference in client politics, like pork barrel legislation. We have concentrated benefits. They only apply to maybe that interest group, but dispersed costs. Next, we have civil disobedience, and civil disobedience for many, many years has been a part of U.S. politics. Really, since the beginning, since the founding of our country, civil disobedience is preached upon and advocated for, and much of that civil disobedience is left up to interest groups. Interest groups on both sides of the political spectrum have used public display, disruption, and violence to seek political and societal change over time. Here we have sort of a march um, in Washington, sort of a parade, example of civil disobedience. We have a public display advocating for LGBT rights. Other examples include the civil rights movement. There was a huge civil disobedience movement in the 1960s and the anti-war movements of the 1960s and 70s as well um, were examples of civil disobedience and we still see civil disobedience in society and in protests today and much of that is led by interest groups and finally we have what we call the revolving door so what is the most common job for a government employee after they resign it is to be a lobbyist. So they walk out of the Capitol as Senator Lott in this cartoon, and they walk right back in as a lobbyist, and they stay involved in that way. Actually, all of North Dakota's former Democratic delegation to the Senate and the House of Representatives are currently lobbyists. 
Senator Kent Conrad actually works for Issue 1, which is a interest group that advocates for campaign finance reforms. And this is true of many, many retired senators and representatives, likely because they already have relationships with these other people that they served with in office. So in that way, they've kind of already built their relationships, and that makes this gig as a, a lobbyist a little bit easier because they're more respected, they're already known, and so on. Finally, how do we regulate interest groups? Now, many regulations of interest groups have been passed and have been tested in court. And some, some don't withstand trial because the actions of interest groups are protected as free speech under the First Amendment. However, we have tried to pass a number of regulations and today interest groups are regulated. First, in 1946, they passed the Federal Regulation of Lobbying Act, which required groups and individuals seeking to influence legislation to register with the Secretary of the Senate and the Clerk of the House. They were also required to file financial reports. However, this law had little to no practical effect because it was not enforced by the bureaucracy. And so years later, they try something new again. In 1995 and then 11 years later in 2006, they tightened regulations on interest groups. And they expanded the definition of lobbyists and required all kinds of new reports. Campaign finance laws also limited a PAC spending on candidates to $5,000 per election. And these regulations curtailed the extent to which any single group can give money. But as a result, they increase the total amount that different groups are providing. Again, you can take a minute to watch this video called the Media and Protest Politics and then answer the following questions. What makes the Tea Party an interest group? We previously had talked about the Tea Party as being sort of a subgroup under the Republican Big Tent. What would make it an interest group? And do you believe Tea Party activists will form a political party? Why or why not? And have the party's tactics been successful in affecting political change? So you can watch that video and take a look at those questions. And that is all for chapter 11. So if you have any questions, anything you need clarification on, by all means, let me know. Send me a Schoology message. And that is all. Thank you.